the real-time decision-making bootcamp. Uh, today is the day of energy, so hopefully there will be a lot of energy. <laughs> uh, we're very pleased to kick off the morning uh, by two lectures offered by Professor Stephen O from Caltech. We'll be talking about uh, the flow of power. So quickly. Thanks, Lord, and thank you for coming. So this is the bootcamp, and there will be uh, three pieces. Four hours for three pieces. Uh, I'll talk about the flow of power, the base of just basic concepts and basic models, and I will come back to that um, for the motivation. And then uh, one of the perhaps most important problems, is, which is the power flow, are the power flow solutions or power flow optimization. And the reason this is very important is because lost numerous power system applications, underlying them are some kind of power flow solutions or power flow optimizations. And all this is about steady state. And Sean then will talk about the dynamic models. So the steady state behavior is suitable for behavior that is of time scales, minutes, and up. Uh, and a lot of applications are that. And then the behavior at a sub-seconds or seconds time scale going down to actually uh, microseconds and so on. So Sean will talk about the behavior of the system at the time scales of seconds up to a minute or so, where, for example, frequency control becomes very important. So uh, he will talk about the control aspect at that fast time scale. And then um, Kamishwa will talk about the, um, the markets. So hopefully through that, uh, this bootcamp, we'll give an overview of really the basics of our system from steady state to dynamics, from engineering to economics. All right, so uh, this is uh, Dick's instruction. The level should be sufficiently mentory so that people uh, this one probably will be poor. So uh, if in power system, you can safely <laughs> skip this uh, most part of it. Okay, so uh, the first part, the basic concepts models. Uh, before I start the, model, the mathematical models, let me try to convince you why we should care about power system, why should we, we should care about energy. And then um, uh, I'll talk about three really key ideas of how do we think about this gigantic system that we built where there's all kinds of signals, there's sinusoidal functions throughout the network, we want to balance them, we want to control them, we want to optimize them. How do we model this and then analyze it, at least for the steady state behavior? So there are three, I think, important concepts that allows us to deal with very simple models. Eventually, we use that model to think about power flow optimizations and so on. And then, uh, using those basic concepts, we can model basic devices, that lots of devices that um, that builds this power system from generators to transmission lines to distribution lines, eventually to loads and transformers, regulators, all kinds of uh, uh, devices in the network. And we'll focus on mainly the transmission line, which perhaps is, uh, one is to give you a sense of how do we model that, but also this is important in, in terms of power flows that, that we're interested in. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about transformers and, and then not too much about generators. And then there's a low models, which is very complicated. Uh, for us, it's just, just one number or two numbers that, that represents the low. Okay, so with all these devices model, then we can build a model for the network that mathematically we can simply represent it by a matrix called a mutants matrix. So a lot of power flow optimizations is expressed in terms of this emittance matrix, and then there are different forms of power flow models. They all describe the same thing, but they have different mathematical properties, and for, depending on the question that you ask, some form may be easier to analyze than the other. So we'll, we'll talk about some of the popular power flow models. And then, uh, maybe in the last bit, uh, I'll formulate what's called the optimal power flow problem, which again is a fundamental problem in power system, simply because it underlies numerous power system applications. And then one, and there are many computational challenges in solving that model, optimizing the power flow within that model. And then I will talk about one aspect, which is uh, convexization. And then maybe uh, the last 15 minutes will be a little bit uh, on the research, which is about real-time uh, OPF, real-time optimal power flow problems that relates to um, the theme of this workshop. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the plan. Let's get started. Why smart grid? So we're really at a watershed moment where if we look at the largest man-made artifacts, perhaps the communication network, at least the modern communication network is really um, the telephone network and the AC transmission power network, both started around the same time, about 140 years ago. 
And both started in a very similar engineering market and regulatory structure to provide a single commodity extremely reliably. reliably. So reliability is the most important uh, criteria in how we design and operate the network. And both grew rapidly through the two wars, post wars, and both even started to deregulate around the same time. That is, that is the era where lots of industries started to, to deregulate. And therefore, the development had been very parallel until about 20 something years ago uh, when the telephone network took an architectural transformation and converged to the IP network because of this little experiment that started uh, in 69. So that changes everything. That, the, the impact is huge. It changes the landscape of multiple uh, industries. The hope is that perhaps there's also a uh, architectural transformation that is emerging uh, that will continue in the coming decades um, that will transform the power system into a much more sustainable, much more dynamic, much more open and, and distributed uh, form. Uh, perhaps becomes the most uh, largest and most complex IoT. Uh, what will drive this transformation? So in, in that transformation, if you look at the, what happened to telecom, the industries have been restructured. Some of the biggest companies uh, didn't exist 20 plus years ago. Uh, the engineering structure has been changed dramatically from a centralized, intelligent, vertically optimized to a distributed architecture, layer architecture that allows changes beyond just communication, just beyond, beyond just, just engineering. This is dramatic changes. And in fact, there are many factors that drive this spectacular success of this transformation in, 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 uh, in communication network. If there's one single element that is most important, it, it will be the layer architecture. The implication of this layer architecture is um, it, it's really profound. So this is, uh, this, these were the largest companies by market cap uh, 10 years ago. <coughs> and these are the companies today. So it's a dramatic change. So what will drive power network transformation? Many factors, and here are two. If you look at the economic sectors in the US, that consume the most energy, all forms of energy, right? So it's, it's oil, it's gas, it's coal, nuclear, hydro, hopefully renewables. Uh, it's the electricity generation and transportation. So these two sectors consume two thirds of all energies in the US. They also emit more than half of greenhouse gases. And therefore, if we really want to drastically reduce greenhouse gases, we have to electrify transportation which increase the demand for electricity, and then we have to generate electricity more and more from renewable sources. So that's going to, for you, to really the, I think, the, the ultimate driving forces for uh, power system or energy system transformation in the coming decades. Okay, so looking globally, right, so uh, the world today, or 2011, <laughs> several years ago, uh, still mostly uh, the energy, all forms of energy, still mostly depend on fossil. Um, the largest five countries in terms of consumption, uh, China, US, Russia, India, Japan, if you look at per capita, is different. Right? And they, the five largest countries consume more than half of all energy. They also emit the most uh, greenhouse gas CO2 emissions, more than half. So if we zoom into the US, uh, it looks like this. So we saw this before electricity generation and transportation generate more than half of um, all greenhouse gases in the US, and they consume two thirds of energy. If you zoom into the energy, right, so these are the primary sources, and these are the applications. And if you look at electricity generation, so zooming to this, the picture looks like the following. So 2014, we generate slightly less than two thirds of electricity from fossil, mostly coal and gas, uh, very little uh, um, you know, oil by now. Uh, nuclear has been pretty steady at about 20% plus or minus. And then renewables that includes the hydro. 90, more than 90% of electricity in the US are generated by about 10,000 large bulk generators. And there are lots of distributed smaller generations, uh, but it generates in terms of energy that, or capacity, uh, they are much smaller. And therefore, really, this, um, this generation mostly are from these both centralized generators. And just converting primary sources to uh, electricity, we lose almost two-thirds. So in order to, raise, to reduce this 
dramatically, we really have to change the architecture of how we generate electricity, combine heat and powers, and so on, much more distributed, for example. So eventually, we use about one third of the primary sources. Historically, uh, if you look at the supply, so in the 50s to about today or so, uh, coal has been growing steadily until about last uh, 10 plus years because of shale gas. And gas is increasing, uh, replacing, displacing coal, despite, uh, despite uh, what we hear from, uh, from the administration. Okay, so uh, if we zoom in, so this is annual numbers. If you look at the quarterly numbers, so that you see this variation, seasonal variation. So gas has been catching up with coal. Um, all fossils combined is about two thirds, slightly decreasing. Nuclear is pretty steady, about 20%. Hydro is about 8%, 8 to 10%, uh, pretty steady. So uh, wind and solar is, is hard to see. So we have to zoom in. Uh, you, so hydro is about 8 to 10%, so that's the reference. Uh, wind has been catching up. In fact, it, in terms of capacity, it, sur it has just surpassed the, uh, the hydro capacity. So that, that's a milestone. Uh, solar is still small, but it's rapidly increasing because the price has been dropping. And also because new business models have been um, uh, popularized in the last uh, five, five plus years. <coughs> OK, so um, the hope, of course, is that uh, eventually this wind and solar um, will displace most of hydro. So that's the hope. Uh, it displace most of the fossil. So hydro capacity is about uh, saturated. There's not a lot of uh, extra hydro capacity. So this is uh, by 2016, uh, hydro capacity has Wind capacity has ex exceeded hydro as a uh, renewable. Uh, so the interesting thing, so this is just, this is, has been several years. Uh, in terms of new capacity installed, coal is zero. This is 2014, right? In terms of the, uh, the renewables, wind and solar, that's, uh, that's um, 75% uh, of new capacity. So the things are moving. This is another interesting chart that shows how rapidly uh, solar has been, has been uh, growing. So these are the forecasts by IEA of the solar, forecast from 2002 uh, up to 2017. So every year they have a forecast. And this is the actual trajectory. So that's hopeful. Um, so some, someone also done some calculations where they use the actual energy consumption in 2008 and then make assumptions to say, what will be the energy consumptions by 2030? So that includes all forms of energy. And then ask if we're just going to capture the solar and then supply all that energy. I mean, there's a lot of engineering that needs to be, that needs to happen in order to do it. But suppose we can do that, then how much area would it cover so that we can supply all energy needs um, from solar? Uh, so this is supposedly to scale. Uh, I'm not sure how reasonable all those underlying assumptions are, but I think the point is there's way more renewable energy in nature than we will ever need. It's really up to scientists and engineers like yourself um, to capture it, to transmit it, distribute it, and manage it, right? which is difficult. Is this under the assumption that the entire transportation is also electrified, or is this ah, just good, good, light bulbs? Very good question. I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, yeah. Good point. Okay, so, so um, what are the challenges? There are many challenges on the engineering side. One of them is this, this uncertainty that is the, uh, of the supply, right? So for the last 100 years, the way the system was designed is that we have complete control on the supply. The demand, at least at the aggregate level, has been pretty predictable. And therefore, the, the paradigm has been we forecast demand, and there's a very elaborate market structure that allow us to forecast um, increasing accurately as we, as we progress towards uh, time of delivery. So we forecast demand, and then we can schedule supply. So we can schedule exactly how much uh, uh, power each generator will, uh, should generate, when and where. Now, if we imagine 80% of our uh, supplies are not controllable, not even very predictable, then drastic changes uh, will be needed 
on how we design and operate the network and also how we um, operate uh, the market. So this is a, uh, a, a, uh, a data from Wind Farm in Southern, Calif uh, US, uh, Southern South California Edison <laughs> SCE. Uh, where this is the megawatts, the output power of a wind farm. This is time, 24 hours. The 30 curves, one per day. So you can see that the output fluctuates randomly, uh, rapidly, by large amount, and frequently. Right. So that's if we have this supply for 80% of our uh, uh, and, uh, electricity generation, that's a problem. So solar is the same thing. As clouds fly by, the, you, the output can drop by 80% within minutes. Uh, in addition, we don't have uh, solar at the night. So that's, that's a challenge. That's so one of the important challenges. So this is the um, measurement of the voltage as a function of time. So the voltages in the network, every point in the network, needs to be regulated tightly around certain nominal value. So here at the outlet is a 120 volt. Um, in the transmission, different parts of the network, you have different levels. So there's a nominal voltage level every point in the network, and that needs to be regulated tightly around that uh, for all kinds of reasons. So this shows that because of the solar uh, penetration, uh, a feeder on, uh, in Hawaii, uh, so this is time, this is voltage level at different parts of the feeder, and you can see that, so these are the low, um, this is nominal value, this is the upper bound, lower bound, you can see that if it exceeds the, um, uh, the, the limits quite often. Right? So the, the legal limits that you, yes? I think we need a definition of the feeder. Ah, so it's basically a, a line that um, brings power from, say, substations uh, somewhere in the network to eventually to here. So we'll come back to this, what is a feeder? <laughs> so it's basically part of the power network that, that brings energy. Think of it like transportation network where the energy flows from eventually uh, from, from, from the generation, the source, uh, to where we actually consume. But thanks, I will try to minimize the, the jargon. OK, so, um, and people will see this uh, news, um, uh, especially not only Hawaii, Germany. Uh, right. So these are, these are real challenges. And because of all these challenges, um, this, uh, uh, you create a lot of hardships, uh, economic hardships and political challenges and all that. Okay, but these are the things we can solve if we have enough people that work on this. So hopefully it's some of the students will be motivated to work on these problems. Um, okay, so today's grid. We, we generate electricity, so it's about 10,000 uh, bulk generators in the US that generate most of the uh, electricity. So these are, say, coal, gas, nuclear, uh, hydro, hopefully solar farms and wind farms. Going through transmission network, uh, get to a substation, you can think of just a node in the graph where, uh, where some of these transmission lines terminate, and then it starts, um, goes to another network, what's called a distribution network, eventually to the households and commercial buildings and all of that. Now, the difference between trans abstractly, mathematically, transmission network and distribution network are the same. This is graph. Um, physically, they're very different. So transmission networks are typically long distance, very high voltage. So we'll see later on why we need the voltage to be so high. So I think the highest voltage now in deployments probably in China is about a million volt. Right? So this is 120, uh, the high, high HVDCs in um, some of the lines is one million volt, right? very high voltage. The distribution networks are shorter distance, um, uh, lower voltage. But one thing already we see that the different voltage levels at different parts of the network. And, and, and that is important, and that is also one of the main reasons underlying why about 100 years ago uh, we went from DC, <laughs> advocated by Edison, to AC, advocated by Tesla. Yes. Just check on topology. So this this is purely tree tree like topology. Ah, no good point. Dags, no loops. Yeah. Distribution network. Almost all of them are tree like topology. There are exceptions. San Francisco. Uh, transmission network. They are almost always mesh network with loops. 
that actually has important computational implications uh, later on when we talk about OPF towards the very end. OK, so many dumb loads. So we don't really control load that much, at least during normal operations. Anyone can turn on the machine, turn off their light, and all of that. And therefore, we let the load do whatever they want. We try to schedule supply to meet the demand. Now, one thing that is very different between power network and internet is that there's essentially no large-scale, inexpensive storage. So supply, demand must be balanced at all times and at all points of the network. So that is a huge challenge. And that's also why we need these elaborate market structures that the commission will talk about. And also why we cannot really separate engineering from, from economics in power system. OK, so and therefore, um, the control paradigm has been, as I mentioned earlier, that we forecast demand and then we schedule supply to meet them. Right? So it's been centralized, human in the loop. You do the worst case deterministic. So when you choose the operating point, you choose one so that if any one of the largest generators or lines goes down, the network will still go to another operating point that is safe. Now, a quick question. Just to explain to everybody, why do you need to stay within a, a small band tolerance for, for electricity? In terms of voltage. Voltage, yeah. Or right. Or right. So, um, um, so the, uh, many answers, but many reasons. But the short answer is that um, the, so I'll come, actually, I'll come back to this. Eventually, what you need to design a network for is that you have a, forecast on the lows. So you need a certain amount of power going to this part of the network at a certain voltage level. So we need this to be 120 volt. A lot of the devices are designed with 120 volt in mind, for example. And therefore, abstractly, we, 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 we forecast where the lows are and what the voltages they need and so on. And then we can work backward. How do we, what eventually will be the voltage that we need at the generator side? <coughs> now there's other factors that come into play, which is, uh, the, in order to mini minimize the energy loss on the network, we need to transmit a very high voltage. So we'll see later on why that is the case. And therefore, the voltage level at the, the low, which is specified uh, here, uh, and the voltage level at the generation, uh, they're not at the high level voltage that we need. So we need to step up. So that's where the transformer is important to transmit at a certain high level voltage so that we can design the whole systems uh, accordingly. OK, so, but, but we'll come back to this point. Um, so the future grid, hopefully, will look more like uh, uh, we may still have uh, large centralized power plants. Hopefully, we have more uh, large plants that are renewable. But also, there are lots of distributed generations uh, that are much closer to the low. Um, uh, rooftop solars and so on. Um, but also, there, there, there are a lot of lows. So if, if you think about, um, in the past, we forecast low and then schedule supply. Now, if supplies are not controllable, much less controllable, then we really need to exploit the flexibility in low to control the consumption to match the supply. And in fact, this can be done. So Sean will tell you a lot about this. Say 70% of electricity consuming buildings. Building has huge thermal mass, for example. Electric vehicle, if we convert electric vehicle, uh, uh, electrified transportation, to so every electric vehicle, well, depending on the size and that is changing and so on, but roughly, at least today, uh, each EV adds about one third of energy uh, demand um, uh, energy to an average California household. In terms of power demand, it can be 1 to 20 times. So uh, if we electrify uh, transportation, on the one hand, it's going to add to the demand, the stress to the grid. On the other hand, EVs are extremely flexible loads. And therefore, we can control those flexible loads to try to help integrate renewables. And therefore, the, the, um, the expectation is that there will be a natural distributed energy resources that are intelligent, that we can control to help integrate renewables. 
So the control paradigm is not only controlling those 10,000 large generators, right? So in the, in the past or today's network, we control a few large endpoints. And then there's maybe, say, a billion endpoints that are just dumb loads. All they do is just consume. But in the future, those endpoints may be different. They're not just passive loads. Some of them may generate, some will, 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 will measure, will communicate, will compute, um, and control. Right? And therefore, we have this huge network of distributed energy resources, and the control paradigm needs to be changed. At least for some applications, it needs to be much more distributed. We need to close the loop, right? If there's, not, if there's no uncertainty, we can schedule everything. As soon as we have sufficient uncertainty, we need to close the loop. Perhaps we, have, we cannot, we will no longer be able to do this deterministic worst case um, operation. Right? So how do we think about risk? I need to be robust in all of that. So that, that's the challenge. So, so it is both a risk in that uh, all these distributed energy resources, they may introduce fluctuations in supply, in demand, in frequency, in voltage, and so on. But, but they are also intelligent, that if we can define the right control structure, then we can probably improve the robustness, security, efficiency. Right, so the, an example people like to use is, is you design the fighter jet to be unstable, and then you wrap around so that you get the performance. Then you wrap around an active control to stabilize it. OK, so uh, <coughs> global energy demand will continue to grow. There's still more than a billion people who do not have reliable electricity. Um, there's more renewable energy than we will ever need. So that's good news. Uh, so someone will figure out how to capture that. There will be connected intelligence everywhere. So the cost of storage, computing, communication, manufacturing will continue to drop. And therefore, the networks hopefully will become the largest and most complex internet of things. And what we're interested in, I guess, the, the, this audience, uh, is to develop theories and algorithms to help understand and, and enable such, such transformation that will encompass, it's, it's, just not, it's, it's not just one discipline, it's not only EE, right? So every, almost every, uh, most of the uh, things that we are interested in, in this audience uh, will, be, will be required. Control optimization, stochastic data, economics, and all of that. Okay, so, so that's, um, hopefully some of you will be convinced that uh, we should care about energy. Uh, the rest of the, 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 uh, the boot camp really is just the basic power system. Yeah, right. so, so here's one motivation why we want to do it. So this, never mind the details. So we'll come back to this slide later on. But the point is, a lot of the power system operations boils down to an optimization problem that takes a form like this. Right. So, uh, and this, this describes the model of the network, the objective we want to minimize, um, and, and all of that. So we could start with this, this mathematical model and just stuff and just analyze it and um, deal with the computational challenges and so on. So most part of this, this, um, this, this, uh, this, this book camp really is not about how do we deal with this. It's, it's about what is this physical system that we are dealing with and how do we model them and eventually how do we come up with this model? Right? So most, uh, most an hour and a half um, or so of the material really will be what is underlying all this model? What, what are all these symbols mean? And what are the assumptions underlying this model? Right. So, so for mathematicians, um, they just want to start with this model. That's perfectly fine. But uh, the boot camp really is about uh, where this model comes about. So hopefully, uh, we get a sense of when we are trying to deal with these computational challenges, how do they relate to the physical system? Okay, so that's what, um, uh, so really the, uh, the, the, um, the clever idea is uh, by Tesla, is this three-phase AC transmission system. And there are three key ideas, I think, that allows us to develop the model that we saw in the previous slide. So let me explain those, those three key ideas. Before that, let's try to visualize what the grid is, <laughs> some pictures, uh, mostly from, from uh, Sasha, who's a, who's a faculty member here at Berkeley. Probably a student, happens to be. <laughs> um, okay, so the grid is most visible in the dark. 
So this is a satellite picture of uh, North America. These are the lines that are underlying them. They're about 190,000 miles of transmission lines. So these are transmission network high voltage and about 70,000 miles of distribution, uh, lower voltage distribution networks. Uh, so we saw this before. So there are different devices from generators to substations and all of that right? at different voltage levels. So that's, that's one important. So, uh, so it looks like this. Right, so these are the gen, uh, generators generate at a certain voltage, uh, go through a transformer that changes the voltage, uh, higher voltage, goes to transmission network. So th the, the squares are breakers. You can, you can connect this, connect, open, close. Uh, eventually get to a sub-transmission network, uh, step down, uh, and then, uh, so, so clearly higher voltage minimizes energy loss in the network. But higher voltages makes the, uh, device is much more expensive, right? Installations and all of that. It's also less safe. We, that's why we, we, we have a 120 volt, very low voltage here, right? This is safer. So it goes to the substations, uh, eventually get to uh, the transformer in the street, eventually come to the house here. Um, so what, what, does, uh, what does it look like? So this is an example of a generation plan, and this is the, uh, this is the surface drop. So the, this line, distribution line, eventually come to the house and then uh, go to uh, a panel, electric panel in a house, uh, and then the, from the electric panel, you get to the light switches and outlets. Um, this is the uh, transmission substation, all those machinery. Uh, these are the transmission lines, these huge towers. If you drive down Highway 5, uh, you see some of that. Uh, if you drive around town, you may see some, some of these things, substations. Again, the, the, the laws of different devices and stuff, uh, abstractly, they, they change voltage levels. They do more than that, but roughly. Uh, and then eventually, this is if you walk on your street, this is something that you might see, unless it's underground. So sometimes it's underground, especially in cities. Then this, these little transformers <coughs> will uh, go from say 12 kV or sometimes 9 kV uh, to 120 or 240, depending on the lines that come to your house. So this is the network um, right. that, that brings uh, electricity from generators eventually down to where we consume. What, what might be the, the capital investment landscape? <laughs> uh, I don't really know much to have any intelligent comment. The only comment I have interesting observation is that uh, in the last many decades, there has been consistent underinvestment in transmission capacity. Right? Uh, uh, for this, there, there are structural reasons. There are, there are economic reasons. There are political reasons uh, why that is the case. Um, but there's one interesting um, conjecture I find interesting that also might explain uh, is an underlying uh, reason, which I just find funny. So if you look at um, uh, different countries, the transmission networks typically owned by one, two, maybe up to four owners. In the US, I forgot the number, but it's hundreds. And therefore, but transmission networks are probably good. If they're owned by many different owners, it's hard to provision probably good. So, uh, so I don't know how important this reason underlies this underinvestment, but I, I, I find it's a cute, uh, interesting. So I think roughly one transformer, one substation translates to about multi-million uh, multi dollars kind of investment. And the generation? Generation is usually quantified <coughs> in terms of how many megawatt uh, yeah, and that type of fuel technologies. But the whole infrastructure, the US power infrastructure is a multi-trillion dollar uh, asset. So there's an interesting uh, problem, question, right? That um, from societal perspective, we have this huge infrastructure that uh, depreciates and its capacity decreases, right? And then you have this new infrastructure that are hopefully being built. These are, say, the renewables or the smart grid uh, innovations and stuff. So from a, as a, from a social perspective, what is the right investment strategy for each one of them so that as the old infrastructure starts to depreciate and uh, the capacity decreases, and then you have demand forecasts and all that, and you build up the new capacity, 
to try to meet the demand. What is the optimal sequence? Uh, that, that, is, that, is, um, that is not clear, but it's, there's an interesting toy model that can answer that question. And then there are lots of questions. That were, so another interesting question in that thing is in the uh, transmission network, uh, the traditional way this, this investment is done in a, in a regulatory environment, yet the new uh, infrastructure, say, or the PVs on the roof and so on, not solar funds by utilities, um, they, they are probably driven by market forces. So can you design the right incentive structure uh, so that you, you, uh, the, this um, uh, selfish agents can actually uh, make individual investment decisions that turns out to be socially optimal? Anyway, so we can discuss offline in terms of. OK, so, so let's start to, to look at this basic uh, uh, models. So the quality of interest are really the voltages, the currents, and the power. Energy is just the integration of the power. All of those are sinusoidal functions of time. And therefore, you have these big networks and sinusoidal functions everywhere. You want to balance supply and demand. You want to control them, and so on. How do you, how do, you do that? Well, uh, we're interested in steady state. So the sinusoidal function of time. So for example, voltage, we take this form. Right? So there's an amplitude, there's a, a frequency, uh, nominal frequency 63 hertz here, uh, and then uh, there's a phase. Right? So we're interested in, in this part of the, of the boot camp, we're interested in steady state. For us, it means that the frequency is the same at a nominal value everywhere in the network. And therefore, uh, this function is specified by just two numbers, the, 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 the amplitude and the phase. Uh, so this is a reasonable model at time scales of minutes and up. Um, and again, Sean will talk about dynamic models for uh, faster time scales. Right? So this part is all about steady state. Okay. And therefore, uh, so the, given this is fixed, so these two parameters that specifies the, <coughs> the, 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 the signal, and that motivates a, what's called this voltage phaser, which is simply given a voltage function, sinusoidal function, you can form this complex number, right? So the, the V max and the theta V. Um, and so this phaser is related to that through this simple expression. So given a voltage function, you can write down the phaser. Given the phaser, you can write down the, the, the time function. So the next thing, and also the, the magnitude of this uh, complex number is the ruby square of, of the certain side ones. So, and therefore, the first concept, interesting concept, is that you can represent voltage by its phasor. Similarly for current. <coughs> Given a sinusoidal current, you can write down its phasor. Uh, so what is it used for? So for example, the, the basic circuit element that's going to model most of the power grids that we will see, right? Boils down to uh, roughly three circuit elements that we're gonna use. So the resistors, the inductors, and, and capacitor. And they follow uh, laws of physics. So you have this uh, voltage at the time is the uh, proportional to uh, the change in current, and so on. Uh, yes, so this is in time domain. Uh, so these are the main circuit elements to model the grid. Instead of doing all your analysis in time domain, you can do all your analysis in the phaser domain. So just from the time domain, from the definition of phaser, you can derive that there's a relationship between the voltage phaser and the current phaser across the resistor, similarly across the inductor and the capacitor. And therefore, you can do all your analysis in the phaser domain. When you get the result, you can translate back to the time domain which is the physical system we care about. So, so I have one example at, at some point uh, on, on how to do that. And therefore, um, phaser representation allow us, right, so we can do analysis in time domain or in phaser domain, and this is a lot easier. Everything is the algebraic. Right? So the steady state described by a set of algebraic equations, these are the power flow equations that we'll come back to later on. So before, before we can write down power flow equations, I want to develop the models for the different devices, eventually build up to the, uh, uh, the powerful equations that describe the network. So again, that's the point of this bootcamp. Um, where, where do the mathematical models uh, come from uh, when we do, say, OPF? Okay, so that's the, uh, 
So, so that's the voltage and the current. So if you're interested only in voltage and current, then it's a linear system. If, but many say loads and stuff are specified by how much power we need eventually. So EV, every kilowatt hour, so every amount of energy, we can go, say, three miles. So we care about energy, we care about power. And that is the product of the voltage and current. That's where the nonlinearity comes in. So if the voltage has this um, sinusoidal, with this cosine function, current has this sinusoidal fun cosine function, you do the product, it, comes, it, it, it becomes something like this. So the interesting thing is that the power is also sinusoidal with twice the frequency. So if you look at the average power, this goes away, this defines the average power. Uh, so this motivates that we can define a complex power in terms of the phasor. So given the voltage uh, across the device, given this current across that, uh, this is the <coughs> current complex conjugate, then we can define the product to be what we call complex power. The real part of it is exactly this average power in time, time average, uh, and then the reactive power is, is the imaginary part of this. And the imaginary power has to do has effect. It's, it's, uh, so the real power is typically depending on, um, on the type of load is what we consume. Say charging battery, we care about this. Uh, but reactive power in general does have implications on how we design the network and operate the network. It heats up the wire, for example. Uh, so the phase analysis, uh, that the steady state behavior is described by several algebra equations in terms of phaser. In, in phase in phase of domain, power is not a phase. Uh, so the voltages and currents are linear, but the power flows are nonlinear. So we're going to describe all the devices and network models and analyze them in phase of domain, knowing that once we get our result, we can always go back to to get the physical um, quantity. Okay, so so that's the first idea. The second idea is this three phase balanced. Uh, operation. Okay, so so suppose we generate electricity somewhere. This is a gas, huge gas uh, generator. Eventually, uh, we bring to the low, so the low consumes certain energy. So the current flows through it and then returns it and so on. Right? So uh, these are three single phase systems that brings power from the generators to the low. We can connect them so that these three circuits share the same return path. Like this. So you can connect the, the generators, right, uh, and the loads so that they share the same return path. That says two wires. Over long distance, right, we have 260,000 miles of these lines. So that saves a lot. And in fact, it turns out if we have a balanced system, which would define what it is, uh, we can also save this wire. So you save half compared with this of the material. So. So this, um, this uh, three-phase uh, Tesla's idea, this is a really clever idea, uh, that you have this three-phase um, voltage source that arranged like this. It's called Y configuration. So you learn Y. Uh, or the impedance, right, like organized like this. Or you can have uh, them connected, wire them in different ways. So this is called delta configuration. Then you connect A to A. <coughs> Uh, B to B and C to C and so on. So uh, the idea of a balanced source, balanced three-phase source, is that the, the voltage phases, so these are complex number of phases, have the same magnitude and differ in phase by 120 degrees. Right. So, so the phase A uh, voltage source has some magnitude normalized to one and some phase angle. The phase B version, you subtract 120, and then phase C plus 120. So it's a very specific arrangement of your voltage uh, phases. Yes. Why three rather than two or four? Right, OK. So it turns out fa three phases have some advantages. We'll come back to that. Uh, so for phase, if you have two phases, four phases, you'll get some advantages, but not the others, and, and so on. So three phase. Uh, I don't know what is the I know, fundamental underlying reason for those advantages. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see see some of that. But uh -huh. yes. So going back to what what phasor analysis is, is it sort of phasor space? It's kind of a very degenerate form of frequency. 
you, you can think, yes, you can think of like that. Extremely. Yeah. Yes. Just to understand better, so the benefit of this three phase is to save on the amount of wire that we. Need yeah. So we'll come back to that. To be able to push through more. For example. Power. Yeah, yeah. But we will come back to this uh, some advantages of the three phase system. So the, the loads are balanced, impedance low. So they're different low models. So for us, uh, mostly low is just impedance. Uh, and we say they are balanced if they are identical. The so three same complex numbers. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so this is in the Y configuration. And then uh, notice that the voltage is between the phase and uh, the neutral. Okay? Now in delta configuration, the voltages are typically specified in terms of the line to line, so phase A line to phase B line. Right? So they are balanced in the delta configuration if those voltage across line AB, uh, across AB, across BC, and across, sorry, CA uh, have the same magnitude differ by 120 degree. So it, so it looks less like this. And same thing, if they are in delta configuration identical, then it's balanced three phase uh, impedance law. So, uh, so here's one example, which we will come back to later on. But here's one example where you have a three-phase voltage uh, in delta configuration. You have a, uh, some lows in delta configuration. And then in parallel, you have some low in Y configuration. And then you can think of this as a transmission line that goes from the voltage source, supplies the first low, goes through more transmission line, Ah, go to, go to the three-phase Y load. So, the question, yeah. so, so if you had a, a, a three-phase light bulb in this format, there would be three filaments. Uh, oh, you can have three light bulbs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you, if you have a motor, which was to see, uh, then you could have uh, windings that supply the one three-phase motor. Okay, to, to keep three-phase all the way through. Right. Uh, if I understand your question, just, yes. We, we don't, in, in our home, we have very few of these kinds of loads. Ah, in, in typically in your home, you only get one phase. Yeah. I mean, there can be split phase, so they go to 40s and stuff, but essentially one phase, essentially. Unless we have EV, so we have a, we deploy a EV charging system at Caltech, those are three phases. So we get all the three phases, and then you have EV connected to, say, between phase AB, another EV connected to phase BC, and so on. And so you try to balance a little bit on, the, uh, on that. OK, so the system is three, balanced three phase if the voltage, uh, the, sources, the voltage sources are, are, are balanced, as defined previously. Uh, the loads are balanced, and then the transmission lines are, are identical. So we'll come back to transmission lines in much more detail later on. How do we model that? Right. So, so this model of transmission lines is an extremely simple model. And there are multiple assumptions how we get from a piece of wire to, to this model that we will go through later on. But this is a three-phase balance system. Right? So, uh, OK, so advantages. Right? So there, there are several, and here's one interesting thing. If you look at the one phase, remember, we, we, can have, we can supply three loads by three single phase power, right? Three systems. And each single phase power is this uh, in time domain, in phase domain. The three phase, in our single three phase, will be the, um, uh, the phase A power plus phase B plus phase C, right? So clearly, it's three times the uh, single phase. No surprise. The interesting thing is if you look at the instantaneous power, it's simply the sum of phase A instantaneous power, phase B, and phase, ah, sorry, VA, VB, VC. Okay, so basically the instantaneous power in each phase sum them up. Wow, it turns out to be a constant. So P is the average power of the single phase, or is a real part of this single phase constant. Uh, and therefore, the instantaneous power is constant in time. So it, if you supply the three-phase motor, you can, you can turn smoothly, for example. Uh, but also, 
uh, sort of alluded to earlier, if you use, say, this three-phase uh, balanced operation versus three single phase, you save about half of uh, the material uh, and lose about half of the power during transmission. I'm not sure I understand what you mean by average power. Um, in a single phase system, you have uh, basically the root mean square, so it's root two of, of the peak voltage is the average voltage. And in a three-phase system, it's higher, but I've forgotten exactly what the three, it is. Yeah. So, the, so three-phase, uh, you simply, uh, you get the same each phase if it's balanced. So one thing that we would actually talk about, if you balance the operation, yeah. the phases decouple. Yeah. So that each phase can be analyzed separately and just like a single phase thing. And therefore, the, the, the power in each phase will look like this, once they are balanced and decoupled. And that's the average power. <coughs> average simply integrate over, yeah, time average. OK. More questions? OK. So um, okay. So that's the second idea. And the third idea, <laughs> yeah. Go back to the previous one. So just to ask again Eric's question, why three and why not two or four? Mm -hmm. So if you have two or four, you are implying that you won't get this constant at the end. Uh, OK. Yeah. Uh, one of them you will, you will not get, at, at least. I forgot two or four. And the other one, I forgot whether you get it or, or not. No, it's like, it's like not, 20 right? degrees is ah, that's how 60. So you get like sine squared theta plus sine squared 90 minus theta equals 1. So sine squared plus cos squared equals 1. So what's, what's the benefit of three phase versus one phase? I mean, you kind of said it, but I didn't quite understand. Um, well, one you said if it is balanced, you can save the return, f return wire. Yeah. So okay. that's save half of the, uh, instead of six lines, you get three lines. But and then you can calculate the line loss. It's about so that's the, I mean, the original idea when he came up with three phases was not to save wire, I'm assuming, right? It was, to, I assume, to supply a three phase motor, right? Was that the original? Well, both are good reasons, but historically, what was the reason that led to Tesla inventing that? I actually don't know. <laughs> three phases versus one, I guess. Yeah. I guess Why three phases versus one? Be because if you have one phase, you need three one phase systems to supply the same amount of power, right? And you lose a lot more, so you need more than three, um, th three times. Can I make yeah. a comment? So yeah. on three phase is mostly on civilian power grid, but three is not like a magic number. You can also go to six or twelve if you want. For example, on the shipboard power systems, most of them are twelve phases, but it's always this three plus three three times because it gives you this nice balanced uh, properties. And is it three phase everywhere in the grid or only some parts of the grid? In transmission network. In distribution networks that come to the houses, typically it's, it's a single phase. Again, if it's split phase, you get different powers, but uh, different voltages levels, but essentially single phase to go to the house. OK, so the third idea is they mentioned that things simplify so that you don't have to analyze all three phases. Uh, so this is one example of, say, a three-phase supply. Assume everything is balanced. Uh, supply to three-phase loads in parallel. Right? So these are, say, the transmission lines and so on. Uh, then you can just do the circuit analysis uh, that all neutrals turns out to be the same potential. So neutral to neutral voltage are, are zero. Um, and it all boils down eventually driven by that the voltage sources are three phase pattern. Same magnitude differ by 120 degree. That really underlies this, this nice thing. So, so what are the implications? One is that you can connect, at least in the analysis, you can connect all the <coughs> neutrals, there won't be current on that. Uh, so, and also all the voltages and currents, line voltages, currents everywhere, 
they will be three-phased and balanced. And the phases are decoupled. Roughly, it means that the variables in each phase, say phase A, depends only on quantities in phase A, but not on phase B or C. So that allows us to, to so these are the properties. That allows us to just look at each phase and analyze it separately. So, so if you look, so you can connect in your model, you can connect all the neutral lines. Then phase A is just this, right? Which is, so this is a simple circuit you can analyze. So it turns out uh, later on, when we look at transmission lines uh, or transformers and so on, everything has this nice per phase structure. So they eventually we just look at at least for a balanced three-phase system, we just look at single-phase models. The powerful equations that we see usually in power OPF problems, for example, they're all single-phase, right? and, and that's the reason. Okay. Ah, okay, so this is uh, be a couple more words. So this is the case when everything's in Y configuration. Naturally, there's a, net, there's a neutral lines and, and everything, it breaks down nicely into this per-phase equivalent circuit. So for a delta, right, uh, there's no natural <laughs> neutral point. But what you can do is that you can convert a delta configurator three phase, say, source, voltage source, into equivalent Y uh, configurator source. And equivalent means they have the same external behavior. That is, if you look at the voltage, say, across AB here, and AB here, it is the same. So if you work, work this out, uh, then the equivalence is given by this simple, simple manner. That if you, if you have a three-phase voltage source in delta, therefore we specify this EAB uh, between line A and B in delta, then the corresponding uh, neutral uh, a phase voltage in the corresponding equivalent Y from configuration is simply that uh, divided by this complex number. So it goes down by square root of three and minus 30 degree. Right. Similarly for the other phases. And therefore, we can convert a delta configurator source to a uh, y. Then, okay, we can do the same thing for low. Given any low, three-phase low in delta, there's an equivalent three-phase low in y. And they have the same terminal behavior. That is, if you apply the same voltage, say across a, b, and c, the current going to A, B, and C will be the same in two configurations. So you work this out, then uh, if I have a balanced low in delta, then the corresponding balanced low in Y is just one third of that. And therefore, the per-phase analysis is that given any circuit, right, there's some delta, there's some Y, convert every delta to Y. And then um, now you have a Y, you can write down the per phase equivalent circuit, say phase A, do all your analysis. Then the corresponding phase B and C variables will just differ by 120 degree. Yes. So <laughs> one can imagine that, uh, so the three phases come, and then, you know, let's say my house is hooked up to one phase, my neighbor's house is hooked up, uh, hooked up to the other phases, now the loads may not be balanced. That's right. So, you know, That's right. so in distribution system, the balance assumption is not a good assumption. You need to look at, you really need to look at unbalanced uh, circuits. So I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that at, at some point. Actually, we are way run out of time, right? So we're, we're, we're too close. I think we can. Up to you. So. No, this is from 9.30 yeah, to 10.30? 10 10 OK. Um, at least I'm done with this part, just one more minute. Right. And then now if, you, if I'm interested in variables uh, that are interior in the delta, for example, I'm interested in this current going through this low, right? then you, you need to solve your regional circuit. But now you have a bunch of variables already figured out from your, uh, from your perfect analysis. So let me just give you an example, not in detail, but sketch uh, what, what, what this means. Okay? So, uh, so let's take this example. So this is a delta um, a three phase balance source with the line voltage between A and B to be 
uh, this en times the right factor so that the per phase uh, source in y configuration is just en. Right? You convert this to y, you convert this to y, so this is um, uh, <coughs> this would be one third. <laughs> Sorry, this would be one third. Okay. Um, so you convert this to 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 the Y. You you get a Y configured uh, balance system. This is a corresponding uh, per phase uh, circuit for uh, phase A circuit for that Y configuration Y system, right? So suppose I'm interested in the time function V two here and I one here. So the way you do this is that you analyze this circuit in the um, uh, per phase circuit, solve for V2 the phaser. Once we get a V2 phaser, we can convert back to the time function. So that's this, <coughs> simple. So what about I1? Well, you can take a couple more steps, but still simple. Uh, from, from this circuit, you can solve for V1, uh, which is, the, um, which is the, uh, the voltage across this. So it's the line to neutral uh, voltage phaser for the Y equivalent uh, load. So from V1, you can calculate what is the, um, uh, the voltage across this, the line to line voltage in the delta, in the phase domain. So it, it gives, it's given V1, you can multiply the right factor, you get the line voltage, you shift by 120 degree. In any case, you can figure out what is the phaser, voltage phaser across A and C. And therefore, you would know the, um, the original uh, uh, impedance, you can figure out what is the phaser for the current from C to A. Once you get the current phaser here, then you can figure out I1 is just in terms of current phaser. It's a minus sign. Here's a direction. So that's the idea uh, of the phaser representation uh, and analysis. Okay, I'm done. So, so these are the basic concepts and then we can describe all the devices and networks and analyze them in phase of domain and using per phase analysis. So that's the bottom line. After all this stuff, we can just do per phase analysis, assuming it is balanced. If it's not, then we cannot. We have to do something. Okay, I will stop here. Thank you very much. So we will reconvene at uh, 11 o'clock. So it's way over.